Go ahead. Okay. Uh, welcome to the second talk of our lecture series of the trimester program. Uh, John Cuyava from University of Oklahoma is going to tell us more about modified trace. Thank you. Um, I, Nathan Gear emailed me this morning to say he's joining us. I don't know if he's in here yet, but um, he's here to provide, you know, rebuttals to any thing I say about him, so I'll have to watch what I, what stories I tell you. Um, maybe, maybe over the break I can tell you some good stories. He and I shared office for several years, so we know each other really well. Um, I will tell you one quick story. I remembered uh, that year when he was in Bonn and I was here and we were working on this project because we're old. That was 10 years ago. And you could use Skype, but it was very sort of pixelated. So we used to write things, you know, about four inches high and hold them up to the camera so the other person could read the formula. So the fact that we're in an era now where I can live stream a talk to you, you know, using a tablet and everything is still amazing to me. But you guys are young, so you don't appreciate that. Maybe Katarina appreciates it. But Nathan and I are old enough to remember when this was impossible. Um, all right, so let's talk math. So I'm gonna be a little bit more precise today, but I hopefully convinced you last time that as representation theorists, we care about traces and dimensions for various you know, theorems and applications of, of you know, eminently sort of representation theoretic things, and, or, or as a category theorist or whoever you might be. And I know the other talks will be focusing on the topology side of things. So there's interest on that side as well. So our setup today is, I'm going to stick with this, which is which is more than I need, and and then the last lecture I'll I'll be even more general, but I'm going to stick with C being a ribbon category. And so let me just tell you a little bit about what that is. So first off, it's a monoidal category. So we have a tensor product, and we have a unit object, like we talked about last time. Um, a ribbon category is a braided category. So we have these, these chosen canonical um, natural isomorphisms from V tensor W to W tensor V, which satisfy, for example, the braid relation and some other, other things. I'm not gonna assume that there are their own inverses though. So I'm not assuming I'm in a symmetric category. So like the, just the flip map that we talked about at the early examples last time, you do it twice, it's the identity. These guys don't have to be. So in particular, like you could be looking at representations of a quantum group or something, and, and those have braidings, which are not um, symmetric. Um, we're gonna have a duality, which just means that we have a, I mean, one way of saying it is, is with that we have a contravariant, oops, endofunctor. which comes with um, these evaluation maps and co-evaluation maps, which have some you know, naturality and so on attached to them. Uh, what am I doing? I want one to go to V tensor V dual. And they have to, for example, satisfy these straightening rules that I drew last time. So if you remember that we drew these as cups and caps and I have to have, you know, this is equal to this. If I stare at that for a second, I think I can tell you that that must be labeled by a V and because of what the cups and caps represented and then the other one too. So that's like this, which if I stare for a second, I think tells me that's a V star. So these kinds of a straightening rules, for example, is built into the axioms of, of what a duality should mean. And then we also have, and this is really kind of the, the, the ribbon structure of it, is we have things called twist maps. So this is a natural family of isomorphisms, theta, let's say, from V to V for every V in my category. And again, there's some compatibility that's required with my other structures that I have in front of me. So for example, um, theta of the dual should be the dual of the theta for V. And if I have the tensor product, you could ask, well, how is theta of V tensor W related to theta V and theta W? They are related. Well, you, your first guess might be it's just the tensor product. 
and that's close, but not quite right, you've got to put in the braiding. B, W, W, V. So com composites of these guys. Okay. And those two betas don't cancel because I'm not assuming it's symmetric. If it's symmetric, they disappear. Uh, and let me just mention about these theta maps because I found them very confusing at first that this implies and maybe is even equivalent to uh, the, the having that, that um, the um, pivotal structure. We have these natural isomorphisms from the double dual to the using the data I have above along with the twist maps, I can make these and, and I, maybe I'll put a. But can, I, only a can I ask a question? Am I allowed to ask? Yeah. So, so does it imply that Sita on the unit is the identity map or do you need to require this additionally if you want to have it? Uh, probably it doesn't require it out of the gate. Okay. Uh, no, because I think I could just scale that and then scale all the other thetas correspondingly and still get another set of twist oh, maps. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, but I'm glad you asked that because that reminds me to say that we're going to assume that if you look at the endomorphisms of the unit object, which I'll be calling K, this is going to be a field. And uh, so this is assumption, but anyway, yep. Okay, sorry to interrupt, but uh, if you have, for, if you take for V and W just the uh, the trivial object, can't you then just imply that it would have to be the theta of the trivial object would have to be one? I mean, but anyway, it's not important. But it's just maybe, maybe. But I, I think you, you anyway. Sorry, you're probably right. Um, yeah, probably this compatibility because the, the, the braiding of, of probably has to be the identity on the trivial. Yeah, uh, yeah. So then you're basically saying it squares to, to one. Uh, or it squares to itself rather, and you don't want it to be zero. Um, oh, yes. And the other thing I was going to say um, is that we're going to assume that that's a field and, and we're assuming that C is K linear. Meaning that all Hom spaces are, are K vector spaces, all our compositions and tensor products are K linear in, in sort of the obvious sense. Uh, the reference I gave last time, which I will repeat here, is Castle's book. There's a nice discussion in there. Oops. And another very good reference, which really does everything in detail, is Taraev's book. Taraev. It's probably misspelled, but that's OK. Um, it's quantum invariance of knots in three manifolds. And in particular, he writes down in a pretty convincing to an algebraist way a proof of why, as I said before, that you can do these diagrammatic manipulations on more on the pictures and that that is makes sense on the morphisms. So it does everything by generators and relations and does things pretty carefully. So I always look at that when I get confused about which exactly which which relations I need to be checking. All right. So as I was just saying, there is a diagrammatic calculus for these categories. Meaning what I was just saying, which is there's a way to draw morphisms as pictures so that isotopic pictures give you equal morphisms. So like the straightening rule up here is just, these are just saying you can straighten these strands, but I'm really saying a certain composite of morphisms equals another morphism on the nodes. And the main thing you need to know uh, to be a little bit careful here is that and this is why it's called a ribbon category is because uh, to draw these properly, you need to draw them as, uh, well, as framed knots. So meaning that you should be thinking of them as being like knot type diagrams with crossings and cups and caps and zigs and zags, but with done with a flat ribbon. 
And the main reason for that is because take something like this guy. If you're thinking of it, that's one of the Reitemeister moves in knot theory that says you can just straighten that out. But if you're thinking a little bit more carefully about what happens if it's a flat ribbon, if you straighten it, it'll end up with a twist in it. And this is exactly for every V. I mean, I'm, I'm maybe claiming something here, but this is exactly your theta V. map, this twist map. And the reason for that is because if you look at this little twist in it, um, one of those cups or caps, depending on which way I've drawn it, uh, will be the cup or cap of my evaluation or co-evaluation, but the other will not. They'll be in the other order. And so far up here in this data, I did not tell you about what I called F prime and co F prime, the other pair of maps. So really, I've only said you have a left duality here. So we need a right duality in order to make sense of what this is. And I'm just going to quickly tell you that that F prime from before, which was V tensor V star to one, is just defined to be by these pictures. Um, theta B, V, V star. So here's a picture red bottom to top, which goes from V tensor V star to nothingness, the void. So that's the unit object where you put in the twist and then that crossing remember stands for the braiding. And now that they're in the other order, I can do the regular evaluation. And similarly for co F prime. You can, you can figure out what that should be. And so with that in mind, then, then that's basically why you have this equal sign right here is because when the smoke clears, you still have that theta that's in there somewhere. All right. And the punchline then is, is if you have a ribbon category, then we now have all of the structure that we talked about last time in terms of we, that we have left duals, right duals. We have a, a pivotal structure where those things are coinciding and it's all sort of encoded in this, in this theta. So all the examples that we were talking about last time are all ribbon categories. So you could be looking at representations of a group, for example, or for a Lie algebra or a Lie super algebra. Uh, but you could also, for example, as I mentioned, be looking at representations of uh, a quantized enveloping algebra. where you can use the R matrix to define your braiding, um, but it now won't be an involution. And that's kind of what makes it interesting if you're a knot theorist, because you don't want overcrossings and undercrossings to match, because that's no good for knots. Um, you can add to this list, you know, every time you have a Hopf algebra, that gives you a tensor product in duals. To get this extra structure, you need a little bit of extra. So whatever that is. What is a twist in the super world? The super uh, unquantized, it's still just the identity, just like it would be for, mm -hmm. for, for um, yeah, I should have said that for the case when we have um, any of these unquantum examples here, which are symmetric categories where the, the braiding is its own inverse, the thetas are just the identity map or could be taken to be the identity map. But then that stops being due, true once you're in the quantized case, for example. All right, so lots of Hopf algebras. Their representation theory will give you ribbon categories. Um, another example, which I quite like, although I do not understand it, is that you can look in conformal field theories. In mathematical physics. Uh, so the 1P minimal model, for example, was an example that we worked out way back when we did this paper. Um, I think I saw Jurgen Fuchs's name come up last time, so maybe he's around. But everything I know is a um, measure zero subset of what he knows because I've gotten it all from his papers. So anything physically related, you should go and be asking him. He, he's definitely an expert in this. Um, but there's some nice examples there. 
Um, certainly when I write grant applications, I always put that in up at the top so people think I'm doing something useful. Uh, the, another example, which will be of interest to some of you here, it, and a good one to keep in mind is diagrammatic categories. A lot of diagrammatic categories are ribbon categories. And I just want to mention one example of this kind of a thing, maybe you know, a, a really good example to always have in mind. If you take K to be C, so take a, and take a, fix a parameter T in there, I can define rep ST, which is going to be a category where the objects are just the non-negative integers, which I'll just call brackets A, just to distinguish that from actual integers. And then the morphisms, well, I need to tell you what HOM from A to B is. And I need to move it over because I didn't give myself enough room. This is the C span of the set of set partitions of one through A, one prime through P prime. So let me explain what that means in terms of actual pictures. So like if I'm looking at something from, I don't know, three to five, then that's one, two, three. I'm just gonna put those as dots down here and I won't even bother numbering them. That's just A is three, B is five. So there's five dots up there. And then set partitions are just, you've, uh, a, a partitioning of this set of, of eight vertices into subsets. And I'll indicate those by just drawing um, edges, which will connect together the, the subsets. So if I draw this edge and this edge, that's now a subset. Maybe this guy's a singleton, maybe this guy's connected to this guy, and maybe this guy is connected to this guy, something like that. And since all I care about is the subsets, any, any picture which has the same connected components is the same set partition. So I'm taking as my homes between three and five, for example, all the, it's a basis of these pictures and it's all possible um, linear combinations of these pictures. And then what is the composition? The composition is stacking of diagrams. Many of you have done this before, where you do a stacking of diagrams. And then if you have any connected components in the middle, you count them up and you take as a scalar in front T to that power. So I'm not gonna do out a whole example because I think most of you have done this kind of game before, but if I wanted to compose D1 and D2, two diagrams, then I stack D1 on top of D2, and then I clean it up to get a single set partition according to connected components, and I put a T to the number of connected components that got deleted out of the middle that weren't connected to the top or to the bottom. And this guy right here is going to be a uh, ribbon category where like objects are self dual and your evaluations and co evaluations are just given by these sort of um, ribbon pictures. Right nothingness will okay I should step back the tensor product is horizontal concatenation as usual composition is vertical concatenation, so if I want to give you uh, a map to nothingness because nothingness will be my tensor unit then i'm just going to do a rainbow of these kinds of arcs or a rainbow of cups in the other direction and you can work it all out and it all you know works very easily to show you that this guy's a ribbon category and the reason this guy is of interest this is deline's interpolating category And the reason it's of interest is because if T is actually N and is a non-negative integer, it could have been anything in the complex numbers, but if you happen to pick 17, then there is a functor of monoidal categories from this guy, this purely diagrammatic guy, to the representations of SN mod. You have a, a full functor, and if you go to Kerbian, 
envelopes, then you get an equivalence up to modding out by some kind of a kernel. And I wanted to mention that in particular that if you have a monoidal functor like this, you could take the objects which are isomorphic to zero. Like if your target is a uh, additive category where that makes sense, then this thing is a tensor ideal in the sense of our definition last time, which I will write in just one second. So that's another bit of evidence that our notion of tensor ideal is kind of the right thing. It's the kernel of a quote unquote homomorphism of monoidal categories. And there's lots of other examples, but maybe we'll get on back to the general theory a little bit since I've pointed us in that direction. Let's first do the definition of that ideal. So if C is a ribbon category, we're going to define I guess I could write the ideal symbol even. It's an ideal. If it's a full subcategory such that one, it had the ideal condition. So J in I, X in C implies J tensor X is in I. And two, it had this direct sum ands condition or this, this retract condition. So J in I, U in C. And if you have an alpha from U to J, a beta from J to U, then if alpha composed with beta is the identity on U, that implies that U should be in I. And it's an easy little check then that the kernel exactly satisfies this. And it kind of explains to me at least why number two should be one of my conditions, because if I have a direct sum of things and I do my functor on it, if it's an additive functor, um, the result's going to be isomorphic to zero if and only if the two terms were equal to zero. So some ands are going to go to zero if, if a guy goes to zero, basically because I can't subtract in a category. <laughs> That's somehow how I think of it. All right. Now we can get on to what uh, modified traces are. So definition. Let I be an ideal of C, always a ribbon category, so I won't keep repeating myself there. A trace, or a modified trace, if you like, on just the ideal is a family of maps. from the endomorphism ring of your object to K for every object in your ideal. Now it needs to be a bit more than that, of course. We need some axioms such that. And I think one of the real sort of insights that Bertrand and Nathan had, um, I think they get credit for this, is sort of identifying what are the key axioms that sort of give you a good theory and let you both for applications and, and, and sort of general development. The first one, well, the second one maybe is the easier one to say. We all know from linear algebra that trace of AB equals trace of BA. So I want that to be true. So if U and V are in my ideal and I have a couple of maps, one from U to V and one from V to U, then if I compose them, in this order, I get an endomorphism of, of U. So I can talk about doing the trace of that. But if I compose them in the other order, then I get an endomorphism of V. So I can compute the trace of that. And I want these to always be the same. And then number one, the one that was a little bit less obvious to me, is you need some compatibility with the tensor structure. So if U is in I and X is just anything in your category, then U tensor X will be a thing in your ideal because of the ideal condition. 
So if you give me an F, which goes from it to itself, there's two things I could do. I could either take it as it is, in which case there's a trace map for U tensor X and I could compute that number. The other thing I could do is I could take that F, now I'm gonna use the diagrammatic calculus because it'll be easier to explain. F goes from U tensor X to U tensor X and instead of writing one strand here for U tensor X, I'm gonna write two strands, one labeled by U, one labeled by X. Remember side by side means concatenation. So that's the tensor product. Same thing up here. And because I have cups and caps, evaluations and co-evaluations, I can close that side off. And now I get an endomorphism of U. U is another thing in my ideal. So I want T of U on that guy to equal this. Okay. It's maybe worth reminding you that the categorical trace, maybe I'll put this in like a green or something, that when we did the categorical trace of a map, it turned out to be just closing up that picture and taking that as an endomorphism of the unit object. And if I had F followed by a G, that's a, well, that looks terrible now. F followed by a G, that's composition, and I were to close it up, it's pretty easy to believe that I can manipulate the picture by taking the G and just bringing it around that circle to the other side, and then I get it in the other order. So the categorical trace has this property number two. And the same thing for the second one. The categorical trace would take, on the right side, would take this picture, which it just sees the strands coming from and out of you and close it up like that. But that's just the same thing as taking both strands from U and X with the F in between and taking them around and closing them up. So these things are like transparently exactly the same thing when you're talking about the categorical trace. So what I'm trying to say here is the categorical trace definitely has these two properties and somehow Nathan and Bertrand saw that these were the two key properties of the categorical trace which made everything hum. Let's go back to blue. Okay. Um, so the question then becomes, when do you have interesting, non-trivial, non-categorical traces? And that's kind of what we want to get to today. That plus a little bit of applications to representation theory. Well, how are you going to come up with such a thing? This is kind of horrifying because you have to come up with linear maps for every object in your ideal. There could be infinitely many. There's some compatibility here that you see. Like, I wouldn't want to do that. So definition, oops. So I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, yes. it might be a good time to take a break. Let me give this definition and then I'll take, take, take your offer of a break. I'm gonna give a totally seemingly unrelated definition, um, which will turn out to be crucial to the whole thing. So let me just do that. Uh, where did he go? Yes. If J is an object of C, we call a K linear map, maybe I'll just call it T from the endomorphisms of J down to K and ambidextrous, ambidextrous, trace, or just an ambient map, if that k-linear map has the following property. If for every endomorphism of J tensor J, well, if I have an endomorphism, J, 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 there's two things that I could do. I could either close up this side, that gives me an endomorphism of J and I could do my T on it. 
or I could close up the other side. And that's also an endomorphism of J, possibly a different one, but I could do T on it. And I want them to be the same. And it will turn out that this notion is very closely related to having traces on ideals. And the main point before we stop for the break that I wanna emphasize is this is just about a single object and a single linear map and a single condition that can be checked in, in contrast to the other definition. So in practice, this is gonna be the one we're actually gonna use a lot more of. But I'll explain all of that in five minutes. Okay, we'll take a break for five minutes and we'll resume at 37. Are there any questions for our speaker? So I have a question myself. Okay. Um, this ambidextrous trace, you don't require it to be a trace in the first place? Nope. Okay. Like if you find it confusing, you can just take the way of the word tra trace. We'll just say the map is ambidextrous if it has this condition. Somehow, um, at least for me, I think of any linear map from endomorphisms to the field as being a kind of a trace if it has you know, some nice properties. But I think trace gets overused here quite a bit. Okay. And also um, for the ribbon hub algebra, um, the module category is a ribbon category. What's the theta map for? The short answer is I don't remember. The long answer is there's this um, twist element of the Hopf algebra that you define using the antipode. And I think of it as a kind of a Casimir type element that you define by doing some kind of a sum over. Okay. Like, so it's something like, I'm making this up, but it's something like a sum over a basis times the antipode applied to that basis, like sum of mm -hmm. xi, s of xi, something like that. I'm making that up, but it's, it's kind of like that. And then it's central, and you're just acting by that element. Yeah, I mean, if I make, uh, for quantum groups, it's basically just Q to the Casimir acting on the acting on the on the module. So that's that's basically what the twist is for for this Turnfield Jimbo quantum groups. Okay. Thanks. Is that just the ribbon element? Yes. Uh, I think so. Yeah, uh, I think so too. Okay. Yeah, my 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 confusion was that it acts on a simple module by a scalar, so it sounds like it's not doing anything. But well, scalars still count. That's what he's saying. Q to a power. That's that's still there. Um, can you quickly explain the uh, second condition um, in the definition of a trace? Um, so why does this hold for the categorical trace of a ribbon uh, category does the second condition like the trace of u tensor x on f is this so, so i stumbled upon this condition uh in checking that the uh, set of all objects such that the uh, identity is a negligible morphism um i needed this condition in order for this to be a tensor ideal so so yes. this would be important yes yes um So this is not going to be a real answer to your question, I don't think. But but basically, the, the the axioms of a ribbon category are just so that if you have an F from a U tensor X, that the cup. So I mean, so you can sort of draw this in two ways, right? This is F with a single strand labeled by U tensor X, and so categorical trace would be just to close this up. And, but if I draw it this other way, the axioms are that that's the same as closing both of these strands up. So the two ways of drawing that picture and the two ways of closing it up agree. And so if I'm looking at, um, that's what I was trying to say over here is that this, this, this thing right here is just by definition, if you're doing the categorical trace on the left side, you're doing 
this kind of a closing up, which is the same as this, and the closing of this guy would be just the closing on that outside strand, which would also be this. So it all comes out to be the same. But it's it's a little bit built into the axioms for the ribbon category that those have to end up being the same. I don't remember what the proof is, but it's it's, it's part of what makes you know the pictures unambiguous. Yeah. So I asked why the green things are the same. Um. Yeah, and I don't remember the proof of that, except I know it's just built into the axioms. So we have to go look in Castle's book. He'll tell us. Feel free to continue. Okay. Uh, let's. So I promised that having a trace an entire ideal is closely related to having an ambidextrous trace. So let me explain that. There's a pair of theorems that we proved in our first paper. The first is that if TV is a trace in the sense of the first definition, then each individual TV is an ambidextrous trace. And that's not completely obvious, but you can, it's not so hard to prove for every V in your ideal. So every one of these traces actually has this ambi condition. Second theorem is, is basically a converse to that. And that says if T from endomorphisms of J to K is ambi, then there is a unique way to extend it to the ideal generated by G. So remember I wrote I sub G for the ideal generated by G. So everything that's a direct sum and of J tensor somebody. It has a unique trace such that um, the trace that I get on J is exactly the ampi trace. So those guys are all ampi traces. And in particular, on the one I got on J is T. This one is actually pretty easy to prove, or at least to write down the key idea. Proof is a very strong word. Um, so given a U in IJ, what do I know about it? All I know is that it's a retract of J tensor X. So I just know that I have an alpha from U to J tensor X for some X and beta that goes the other way. And so I have F, let's say, from U to U. I need to define a scalar from this guy. Well, I have beta which goes from J tensor X to U, F goes from U to U, alpha goes back to J tensor X. So I can make this picture by doing that composite of three maps. And then I can just, when I don't know what to do, I just close it up. I don't know what the heck is X is, so I'm gonna close it up. That now is an endomorphism of J. So I can do T on it. And this, by definition, is what T of U of F is going to be. And the point here that has to all be checked is, A, that this is well-defined, because there could be lots of alphas and betas and lots of Xs, and B, that once you do have a well-defined family of maps, that it satisfies these trace conditions. So this is what I was saying a minute ago, is that if you give me an ambi map, that just propagates out and gives me a trace across the entire ideal. So that that's, makes finding traces a doable thing. And that's why I have to tilt up my shirt. Nathan will be proud. I'm wearing my ambidextrous t-shirt. I bought these uh, for us when we were working on this project. So ambi is a pretty useful concept. And that, in fact, is, at least in the initial stages, most of the traces that we could come up with were because we found an object and a map on it, endomorphisms that, that were satisfying this ambi condition. Um, so let me 
say, once you have a trace on an ideal, like for example, maybe you've just used this theorem, but once you have a trace on an ideal, you have a notion of a dimension for the objects on that ideal where you just take the trace of the identity map, just like we did last time. So I'm gonna talk about the dimensions of objects in this ideal, but it's with respect to the trace of the identity where the trace is whatever my trace on the ideal is. Oh, and I should have also pointed out, it's obvious, but it's worth saying explicitly. Obviously, if T is non-trivial, this equation Tj equals T means my trace is not trivial. Maybe it's not non, maybe it's trivial on some of the ideal Ij, but there's at least some parts of it where it's non-trivial. So this is giving me non-trivial traces. You can always do zero and that's stupid, but you can do it. All right, so let me write down a theorem which tells you some of the things that you can do here. So if C is abelian and J is ambi, so that IJ has a trace, I mean, those two are basically equivalent. And let's assume that J is simple in the sense that its endomorphism ring is just the field. And I'm gonna to need to assume that evaluation map on J dual tensor J down to the unit object is an epimorphism. But of course that's gonna be true in any reasonable case where like your unit object is the field or something like that. But in general, that needs to be part of your assumptions. Then some stuff is true. One, if you take ij, and if you take a v in ij, then the ideal it generates, basically, obviously, by definition, will be contained in here. And if you take a u, which is an object of iv, then I'm going to write dj for the dimension with respect to the trace on ij that I got from the ambi object j. If the dimension on V is zero, then the dimension on U will be zero. Two, we have an onto map, which is evaluation tensor one, given by J dual tensor J, oh gosh, tensor V. So this goes to V, or to the unit object tensor V, which is isomorphic to V, and this is going to be onto. This thing splits if and only if the dimension of V is not zero. So these functions actually tell me something, you know, sort of representation theoretic or module theoretic. And number three. If J is not projective, but P is projective, then P will be in the ideal generated by J. We talked about this a little bit, some folks last time, that the ideal of projectives will be contained in every ideal. And that's just what I'm saying right here. But it will actually will be a proper ideal And in particular, I know that the dimension of these guys will be zero. So let me take this theorem and recast it back into the classical setup. So when we take J to be our unit object, then the um, map, which the endomorphisms is K, so I can just take a scalar to itself for the unit object, and that will provide an ambidextrous trace that's like trivially easy to check, and that will give me exactly the categorical trace, and that will exactly give me a dimension function, which is the categorical dimension. So for example, for finite groups or for Lie super algebras, this is the ordinary dimension and the ordinary super dimension. So we're all the way back down to the original thing, and if I'm in that case, and I write down what these theorems are saying, it's saying that if the dimension say as a vector space or the super dimension, if it's a super space of that V was zero, then the dimension of the U 
had to be zero for any sum and u of v tensor x for any x. Two is saying that this map j star tensor j to the unit object, which is maybe it's my trivial module, splits. That is to say the trivial module is a sum and of j dual tensor j, if and only if the dimension of j is not zero. And number three, it's telling me that the dimension of any projective is equal to zero. And for finite groups, for example, number two is just this theorem of Benson and Carlson that we talked about at the very beginning last time. And number one was this fact that I mentioned before, which is also well known in that community that if you have an indecomposable guy who has dimension divisible by P, then all the sum ends of V tensor anybody will also have dimension divisible by P. And number three is another one, which is that the projectives always have dimension divisible by P. Or I could have said super dimension, super dimension, super dimension. And these are also less well known maybe, but they're also true. But this is saying, not only is it true, you know, sort of in the categorical framework, whenever you look at categorical trace and dimension, but it's actually true for these dimension functions for any trace on any ideal. Right. So I think the, the last thing I want to do today is to talk about the bring it back to the Katz Wakamoto conjecture and this generalized Katz Wakamoto conjecture. And so let me write down one more theorem, which will be used in that discussion. And that is if you have a V in an ideal generated by a J where V and J are simple, by which I really mean I need the endomorphism ring to be the ground field. That's actually the condition I'm using here. Then, well, IV is contained in IJ always, but it turns out that it's equal if and only if the dimension that object T is not zero. So I gave one direction of this in the previous theorem, and now I'm saying it's true for an if and only if, at least as long as they're both simple. So this is really telling me that this dimension function is telling me something. There's a couple ways to interpret this. You can say it's telling me about the ideal structure of my category. There's a whole industry of people who study the classification of tensor ideals, thick tensor ideals, and categories. Uh, for example, there's this thing called the Balmer spectrum. If you take a category with a tensor product, think of that as your product and a direct sum as your addition. You can talk about ideals, so that's what we're doing, but you can also talk about prime ideals. And then you can talk about the spectrum of a category. And this is a, you know, algebraic variety of, of, of a certain kind. And you can study that, or you can study the classification of ideals. And this is telling you that the dimension function is, is giving you some control over when these ideals have to be equal or not. Uh, why would you care about these ideals? Well, this is telling me when I can make, if V is contained in IJ, it's telling me that using the operations I have, tensor product and direct sums and direct sum ands, V being in there is just saying I can make V from J using the, the, the operations that I have. And there's lots of invariants that show up in representation theory like support varieties, complexity, cohomology, which are well behaved with respect to tensor products and with respect to direct sums. And so this gives you some control over these invariants and how the invariants for V and the invariants for J are related. So I'm just saying some words right now to just sort of convince you that, that I hope that these dimension functions telling me of this about ideals is really telling me some useful facts about representation theory. So let me write down a little bit about the generalized katz wakamoto conjecture, and maybe that's where I'll end it today. I have a little bit of space up here. So let me just translate the katz wakamoto conjecture for you. It said that if you had a simple module L of lambda, that its super dimension 
was equal to zero if and only if the atypicality of L of lambda was strictly less than the maximal, which I made a point of telling you was the atypicality of the trivial module. And the way I look at this now is this is the dimension with respect to the trace that I happen to get from the trivial module of L lambda. So it's about the vanishing of the trace that comes from the trivial module and it being an ambidextrous object because the ideal it generates is the entire ideal and the dimension it's giving me is the super dimension and these numerical invariants related to, to the two simple modules. So from that perspective, there's an obvious hope at least of how you could generalize this. So can, can I ask again? Uh, yes. This atypicality of the trivial module, is this always the maximum possible atypicality? Yes. Yeah. Yes, certainly for the basic classical ones, which is the ones I was giving this conjecture for. You could just compute it every time and that's what it comes out to be. Only basic classical, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how I framing this conjecture. Um, the generalized Katz Wakamoto conjecture. So some of this we proved in our original paper. Some of it ended up getting proved by, by Serganova for GLMN. I proved it for OSP M2N using sort of some of her techniques. And so I think for the basic classical, it's more or less done. But at the point of, of when we wrote our first paper, at least it was semi-conjectural. So number one, we conjectured that if the atypicality of L of lambda is less than the atypicality of an L of mu, two irreducibles, then the ideal for L of lambda should be contained in the ideal for L of mu. So in particular, that's true. The atypicality is just a finite sequence of integers, so there should be a corresponding chain of ideals, one contained in the next. Two, each of these ideals, uh, mu, I guess, has a non-trivial trace. Or because of the discussion I had earlier, equivalently, each of these L mu's has a ambi, ambidextrous uh, linear function. Three, consequently, I have a modified dimension function just for this ideal coming for that trace, which is only defined on this ideal. And that dimension function on an L of lambda, if number one is right, whenever the atypicality is less, of L of lambda is less than the atypicality of L of mu, the ideal of L of lambda is contained in the ideal of L of mu. So in particular, L of lambda is contained in that ideal um, for L of mu. So in particular, I can compute this dimension and this thing will be not zero if and only if the two ideals are the same. Sorry, what is written in two? L. The ideal, each of these, I, every irreducible gener generates an ideal. Number one says there's a chain of them, and then number two says every one of them has a non trivial trace. In, in the sense of my definition from earlier today. But as I mentioned, but I'll say again, even if I have a non-trivial trace on the ideal generated by L of mu, if I restrict it to the ideal generated by L of lambda, it could become trivial, right? It's going to be, could be zero on some things. This is exactly what's happening with the negligible morphisms, right? You have the categorical trace on the entire category, but there's a big chunk of the category where the trace is vanishing. And that could happen here with respect to these two ideals. Okay, so the, what I'm saying here is, is that you really only have um, a chain of ideals. Call this I0, I1, up to, I don't know, IR, which is the entire category of finite dimensional representations, where IK is generated by any one of the simple modules of atypicality K. because they're all equal as long as they have the same atypicality. And, that, and also that every one of these ideals has a trace, a non-trivial trace.
And it's basically because I'm saying that these are actually all going to be strict. If the dimension vanishes, that's exactly telling me that um, this quote unquote negligible morphisms for one ideal are just going to be giving me the, the next ideal. So corollary to this. Oh, I should say, I mean, so the, I hope that you look at this and see the Katz Wakamoto conjecture. If L of mu is the trivial module, then the ideal that generates is the entire category. So of course, every module is contained in there. It has the categorical trace and the dimensions supposedly supposed to be not zero if and only if those two ideals are equal. But those two ideals being equal is the same as having the trivial module as a sum and, and because of the earlier things I was saying, that's just the same thing as the dimension not vanishing. So, and, and so it's all, this, this should be, this is a generalization of the, the katz wakamoto conjecture. So it's a theorem now. And as a corollary to this, for example, for GLMN, where it's a theorem, if L of lambda and L of mu have the same atypicality, which recall, that's just a numerical invariant that I compute using the root system and the lambda and the root system and the mu. So these are just some numbers that are not that hard to compute. Then L of lambda is a sum and of L of mu tensor sum X, because it's in that ideal and vice versa. Maybe it's a Y now. So this was used in a crucial way in a paper with myself, Bo, and Nakano, where we're computing some of these invariants that I mentioned, complexity, support varieties for the irreducibles. And this is exactly telling me that all of these invariants are the same for all of the irreducibles of the same atypicality. So suddenly from having infinitely many modules that I have to think about, I can just pick my favorite one of atypicality five and work with that one. So this was crucial to being able to compute these invariants. And this is a purely, I hope you look at that and say, well, that's a purely representation theoretic statement, but I don't know of any way to get to it without thinking about all this categorical modified dimension stuff. So if and only if, Yes, because if, if, if both of these are true, that says the ideals are equal. Oh yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So by this if and only if, mm -hmm. it's telling me that the dimension is, is, is non-trivial, which, yeah. Oh, oh, I guess I should say here, that there's a second if and only if that could be put up here. This, this, this non-vanishing or is equivalent to the ideals being the same, but it's also equivalent to the atypicality of L of lambda equaling the atypicality of L of mu. That makes it a little more explicit that really it is just the katz wakamoto conjecture generalized. And so this is true for the special orthogonal group as well? For, for like OSP? For SOSP, or do you claim it only for OSP? Oh, I'm sure it's true for SOSP. Yeah, SPO, what? whatever you're saying. Yeah, I, I'm sure it's true. I did for OSP, but I don't see why there should be a difference. So next time what I'll talk about is some more examples. And I will also talk about how to uh, set up this theory in when you don't have the full structure of a ribbon category. For example, the braiding wasn't really essential as long as you talk about left ideals versus right ideals. And we have much stronger existence theorems now than um, for a while, basically we just had, well, you have to show something's ambi, so here's some way of showing somebody is ambi and then that gives you a trace, but we have, we have better theorems now. So I'll tell you about some of those next time. Um, maybe I'll mention two last things, three last things, and I'll write them on my slides before I send them to Daniel. Number one, I talked about the functor from the Deline category to representations of the symmetric group and the fact that it has a non-trivial kernel and that is an ideal. It has a non-trivial trace. So that was something I did with Johnny Combs some years ago. And that, that's a purely combinatorial category. So you can't really think about these things as being vector spaces and so on. So it's really something at the category level. So it's a good example to keep in mind when you start like thinking about these things. 
Number two, uh, Thorsten Heierstorff and Wenzel last year showed that there's modified traces for the ideals for a variety of other domain categories, but also for the tilting modules for algebraic groups and for quantum groups at roots of unity. Um, so that's a nice, interesting family of examples. But then the last thing I want to say, because I don't want you to go to Daniel's 11 p.m. talk or whatever he's doing to you tonight, um, without this non-example, if you take SL2 over an algebraically closed field, literally the Lie algebra SL2 over an algebraically closed field of positive characteristic, of odd characteristic, let's say, and you look at the category of finite dimensional SL2 modules, well, that it will be a ribbon category in a very easy way. The only ambi simple modules will be the ones which are either projective simples or restricted simples. And SL2 has many others. And for simple, you don't have much choice for that trace map because a simple, it's, it's K to K. So it's either zero or not zero. And no matter what you do, it won't be ambi and hence the ideal it generates won't have a trace. So there's definitely non-examples in like one of the nicest possible situations. So this is what I was saying last time, which is it's still a mystery to me exactly when you have these traces and when you don't. You often do, but you definitely don't always. Anyway, we'll talk more about when you do have them next time. Thank you. Okay, let's thank our speaker. Um, are there any questions? Uh, yes, I was wondering, so you stated the katz Bakimoto conjecture only for classical Lie algebras or basic classical Lie algebras. Uh, what exactly breaks down if you try to write it down for strange Lie algebras? Because I think you mentioned root systems and that exists for QN, for example. Um, I don't know if it's easy to say that. I, th I think my problem in type Q would be, I'm not sure what the definition of atypical is because it's defined in terms of the bilinear form on your, on your um, dual of your carton. And uh, for the basic classical, it comes because you have this killing form. So that induces one on H star, but in, in type Q you have an odd bilinear form and I'm not sure quite how to think about that on H star if, if, um, so, well, so, yeah. John, you could, you could interpret atypicality as the Levy length of a projective. So the, the, the atypicality of a, of a, of a weight lambda is the Levy length of the projective cover of L lambda. Okay. And sure. then you can define this, this atypicality for QN. Mm -hmm. And I think your argument should go, just go through. The old argument. Don't you believe that? Maybe. I, I don't know. I'd have to think about it. So just a remark about superdimensions for QN. I, I think Cheng sh showed that uh, the superdimension of an irreducible module is always zero unless you have the trivial module. Um, so the katzbach moto conjecture cannot go through unless, I mean. Well, you can. It's just that everything oh, yeah. is atypical or typical rather no yeah right. doesn't have maximal atypicality <laughs> if, if that's going to be you know some version of that but it's consistent with the fact that there's not many blocks right in q in pn for instance there's only i mean there's whatever three blocks. Sure. no it'd be it would be a good question to think about i i I didn't quite know how to think about atypicality for Q and P, so I'd never, well, maybe I have better ideas now because I've read uh, the WinArt papers and so on. So maybe I'll come back to that, but. I mean, I should also mention for PN, there's a characterization which irreducible modules have non-vanishing superdimension. It's due to Entova, Eisenbart, and Saganova. I don't, I don't know if it disagrees with any notion of maximal atypicality. But in principle, I mean, the super dimensions or when they are zero or not zero or what their value is, is completely known. Yeah, I think for both type Q and for type P, there's a, which is this result you're talking about right now, um, there's sort of a good notion of typical versus atypical. And, 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 and there's a good notion of super dimension vanishing or not. So yeah, they came up with the analog 
of, of, of that condition. I just need to know degree of atypicalities, the correct notion, so I can go deeper into the category and take sub ideals and sub ideals. Um, but maybe maybe what Katarina is suggesting could be a thing there. Um, from the support variety point of view, Brian Bowen and I did a paper on, on the CATS modules from type P and, and the complexity and the support variety calculations we did there suggested a combinatorial definition of, of atypicality in terms of runs, we called them, but successive values of your, of your highest weight, which are equal. So it was just a GAN term and just in terms of lambda, mm -hmm. as opposed to the representation theoretical one that Katerina was just describing. Maybe I can mention one more difference of this PN case with the other cases. So if you prove this generalized Katzbach emotive conjecture and modified superdimensions for GLMN or OSP M to N, uh, then the way to prove this is typically that you say you have one such modified trace on the projectives, um, and then you use this DS functor or so to go down to, to projectives. And this somehow doesn't work nicely, I think, for PN, because uh, for PN, uh, there are no irreducible projective uh, modules. So I think that at least the argument doesn't work in the same way. Yeah, you, you should really be asking Thorsten. He knows more about things you can try that don't work <laughs> probably than I do because he's thought about this uh, pretty recently. What he was just saying was is for this generalized Katz Wakamoto conjecture, the way you prove it is, is you get a trace on the projectives using the, the AMBI notion that, that I was just talking about. And then I sort of alluded to it, but every time you have a monoidal functor from one category to another, you can use that to lift a trace from the target category to your domain category. And so in this case, he's talking about the duflo serganova functor, which is a monoidal functor to, from these super algebras representations to ones of a lower rank. So you can, if you choose judiciously, you can push it down to the projectives for somebody of a lower rank, you have a trace there. And so then you can lift that back up through your functor to get a trace upstairs. And that's exactly what uh, Serganova did in her paper. But um, that depends on getting it downstairs at the bottom in the projectives, which Thorsten is telling us is no good. So how, how unique is a trace? If J is an irreducible, um then the ambidextrous trace on the endomorphism ring is unique up to a scalar because it's just k to k and then that determines it on the entire ideal now if you give me some tensor ideal in general could it have more than one uh possibly i don't know it's, it's pretty hard to think about what general ideals would look like in general traces if they're not principal ideals that are all controlled by that one object. I was thinking that there is some sort of whatever commodity theory or something which 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 um, controls it. That would be great. I I don't know quite how to think about these. I really want to think about them as like, you know, uh, as as you know, I sort of mentioned this Balmer spectrum where you can associate a spectrum which is which is defined by ideals, and I really want to think about these as being functions on that spectrum, just like you would in algebraic geometry. So I don't know how to make sense of that, and I don't know how to make sense of what you said either, but I haven't given enough thought probably to, to have a sound opinion. But I definitely feel like I don't understand these traces conceptually quite as much as I need to, or wish I did anyway. It's definitely a little bit ad hoc right now. Case by case, you construct them or have theorems which give, give them to you. Um, do you have a reference for the theorem before the generalized uh, katz bakimoto conjecture for the long theorem? Yes. So this is my first paper with Nathan and Bertrand, which I don't remember the title of. Um, I'll put it on my notes before I give it to Daniel, but it's from 2009, 2010 in that time frame, and we, we discuss it in there. And then the proofs of it are in a paper of Serganova and, and myself maybe four years later or so. That sounds about right. Thanks, Amit. So uh, I had a question. Uh, there was a theorem where you had sort of uh, three statements and then you specialized 
of the three statements to where J was a unit object. Mm -hmm. was, uh, I, and I didn't see how this, I, I think I saw how the first and third statements implied the first and third statements, but I didn't quite understand how the second statement above implied number two here. Sure. So number two here, Oh, wait, 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 wait. Oh, I'm, ah, I'm very glad you asked that because I think I swapped my V's and my J's as I was writing that. There, anyway, uh, let's stare at this for a second. Yes, this is stupid. If J is, if J is the unit object, then I just have J, I just have unit tensor, unit tensor V, which is V and there's, the, yeah, the map is just, yeah, okay, that's stupid. Thanks for asking that, please, please. I'll need to be swapped. Nathan should have yelled at me, maybe. But I can't blame him for my foolishness. So this is um, J, J, B, V. So now if J is the unit object or the trivial module, I end up getting just evaluation going from V dual tensor V to the unit object. So the unit object the trivial module being a direct sum and of v dual tensor v is the same as the, the dimension not vanishing. Okay, thanks. Thank you for asking that because I wouldn't have caught that later. So yeah, let's fix that down here too. There we go. Great, thank you. But then doesn't that change? So your assumption was that J dual tensor J subjects by evaluation, right? I mean, somehow well, you want the map in two to split, so that should be coming from V dual tensor V subjects, right? Yes, 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 yes. I I was copying it too quickly. So let me fix that too. So this guy right here. It's really meant to be a condition for number two. And that's a nice thing about iPads is I can hide all my mistakes. And this is supposed to be B. So if that and if that map splits Thank you. The problem is, is in number two, for unknown reasons in my notes, I swapped the V and the J, and I tried to swap them back very poorly on the fly. So I'm sorry about that. Other corrections? So uh, down further down a little bit when you take not corrections just okay. when you take uh, your j to be the um the the one the trivial object mm -hmm. um, isn't that when you take the principal ideal generated by that isn't that just the whole category yep oh, okay so then the ideal generated by one will be the entire category and up to choosing how you scale it the trace um, on this ideal given by the your choice of ambidextrous map on on the endomorphisms of one is the categorical trace okay. so, this so is right so if i take so if so one is ambi it's very easy to check and you'll see that there's nothing really to choose because you have a map from endomorphisms of one, which is the field to itself. And then that propagates and gives you a trace across the entire ideal. And when you unravel the definitions, you're just writing down the categorical trace again. I see. And the, and, and the dimension that you're getting then is the categorical dimension. And that's what I was saying here. These dimensions are dimension or super dimension as the case may be, because that is the categorical dimension in those cases. So I have another very basic question at the beginning. So when you when you talk about this uh, ribbon categories, yes. you had 
these tools and then you had the twist. So yes. my question is, are there natural examples where you have tools but no twist? I mean, that's a question maybe for everybody. Because I, I don't really, I, I, I don't have a good feeling under which conditions such a twist should exist or whatever. Well, you could absolutely have, well, I'm not gonna say a useful thing, but if you just look at Hopf algebras, there's a notion of pivotal Hopf algebra and there's a notion of ribbon Hopf algebra and you can absolutely, there's examples of, of one which is not the other. And a pivotal Hopf algebra has everything except for that. But is there anything which is, I mean, of, of course, I know you can construct some by hands, but is there any, any such examples which appear really in nature? Not that I know of, but I probably will think of all the same examples as you, which are very sort of mainstream things, right? Um, um, I don't know if you're looking at like conformal field theories or things like that, it's probably maybe you can find them there in a semi-natural way, but, but I don't know of any good examples, no, because I think of the kinds of examples we just talked about today, which all have it. Nathan probably should be chiming in because they have some weird examples of these categories where you don't necessarily have the full ribbon structure. Maybe I'll think about that for next time if I can come up with a good example. Because I think I, I, I know how to categorify twists and I know that sometimes they don't exist. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Well, as usual, Katerina, you probably know more than I do. So. Okay, are there any more questions for our speaker? All right, let's thank our speaker again. So I'll see you in 47 hours or so, is that right? Uh, something like that, yes. Okay. Send me the slides. I'm interested in the last example you said. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll add those examples and send send you okay. those things in a little bit. Videos should be online tomorrow, hopefully. All right. So, Thanks, everybody. Nice. What it, was it? it uh, Seventy-two hours or whatever. No, no. Uh, Forty-seven. No. Forty-seven. Forty-seven is much better. Thank you very much. <laughs> so see you in forty-seven hours. All right. See you guys. See you guys.